So we're going to introduce our panelists now. As you can tell, there are a wide variety of films, from romantic comedies to urban thrillers to dramas. Um, and I, we're going to introduce them in the order of their films, if you can remember back. Um, our first filmmaker made Life Happens. She has studied at AFI. She's had a lot of, started out with short films and comedy sketches on Funny or Die and had one, Idiots, that went viral. Um, she has also uh, made a, a film that, that was made for Virgin Airlines that's a short that uh, was shot all at 35,000 feet, quite interesting. Uh, she has a film right now that's premiering at Tribeca and a previous film at Tribeca. Please help me in welcoming Kat Cor Coro, right? Coiro? Coiro. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> Our next panel is Ben York Jones, co-wrote and often collaborates with Drake Jeremus on Like Crazy. Um, that was uh, an award-winning film at Sundance last year. They had Breathe In at Sundance this year. Um, as you could tell, Jennifer Lawrence was in Like Crazy and it was made for a, a really great low budget, which is awesome. He'll tell you all about it. Welcome Ben York Jones, please. <laughs> Amy Lagos's film, played at South by Southwest, won breakthrough performance for Evan Ross, um, 96 Minutes. It was an urban thriller, and Amy was also named Best Director, and the film was named Best in Festival at the Boston Film Festival. And she has a film right now, No Good Deed, that is about, it's in post-production and is about to come out in theaters soon. Please welcome Amy Lagos. James Ponsold has had three films premiere at Sundance, Off the Black in 2006, Smashed, which is what you just saw um, last year, and this year he had The Spectacular Now. Both of those films um, won a special jury prize, and Smashed was also nominated for an Independent Spirit Award. Welcome, James Ponsold. At this year's Sun Sundance, Jill Soloway, won Best U.S. Dramatic Directing Award for her first feature, Afternoon Delight. That was the last clip that you saw. She's a three-time Emmy nominee for producing Six Feet Under and was a showrunner on HBO's How to Make It in America and Showtime's The United States of, of Terra. Please welcome Jill Soloway. And we're very lucky to have as our moderator this evening the Vice President of the WGA, Howard A. Rodman. He's also the founder and chair of the Independent Writers Caucus. He's a professor and former chair of the writing division at USC and is quite an uh, awarded author of his own, both screenplays, novels. Um, he did the film Savage Grace that starred Julianne Moore in August, that starred Josh Hartnett, Rip Torn, and David Bowie. Please welcome Howard Rodman. The reason we're here tonight is because think of the things you do or can do or have done or might do when you're finished writing a screenplay. Um, you know, um, some of us, you know, um, hit save uh, and take a long hot shower to wash it off of us. Um, some people send the PDF to their representation. Other people um, enter screenplay contests like the Nichols or enter things like uh, apply for the Sundance Screenwriters Lab. Um, still others like myself printed out, who are old school printed out on paper and then you try to punch the three holes and you realize your hole punch will only take 10 pages at a time. So you make 12 little stacks and then you put it together and the holes don't line up. <laughs> that's, that's what I do. Um, or, um, you can go around for a long time trying to find uh, a director or trying to find cast, or you can make it. And that last alternative is what we're here to talk about tonight. I think for most of us, uh, that leap of imagination should be obvious, but is often the hardest one to make uh, because it requires uh, a sense of agency, when as writers we're taught to be passive. It requires a sense of community, when much of our work is solitary. And it requires um, taking real life situations into our own hands, 
if we were any good with talking to people, would we have become writers in the first place? Uh, I mean, so, so um, it's a leap, but as I think we will find out tonight, a wondrous leap and one that for all of its uh, uh, joys and concerns ends up producing movies rather than gorgeously bound screenplays, all of whose three holes precisely align. Um, what I'd like to talk about first is um, just a, a sort of question of imagination and budget. When you're writing prose fiction, um, how many of you write short stories, novels, stuff like that? Um, you know, to write the sentence, um, uh, he sat on his ill-furnished couch in the Red Hook section of Brooklyn, alone, lonely, abandoned, and useful, will cost the same amount of money to print as the sentence, Times Square, New Year's Eve, 1999. <laughs> but when you're writing it in a screenplay, those have vastly different consequences. So I think what I want to ask, starting with Kat, and then asking uh, Ben, and then Amy, and then James, uh, and then Jill, is when you first started writing, how conscious were you of the scope and budget of what you were doing? And were there any other things like questions of casting or questions of location or other things that you took into consideration because you knew you were writing this to make rather than writing this to flog? It's, it's funny because when I, when I made Life Happens, I had no idea what I was going to do with it. It was the first thing that I'd ever really written. And I feel kind of happy that I was able to go into it with that naivete. And I didn't really think about who I was going to have to cast or what locations I was going to have to find. You know, in the films I have done after, I've definitely come into the writing with like, I cannot have more than 10 locations because it will drive me insane when I have to go actually make it. And um, so the scale on that film for the amount of days we shot it in and for our very small budget was really large. I mean, we had a company move um, every single day. We, we moved twice. And, you know, if I had to go back and do it again knowing what I know now, I would have limited myself. So it's a tricky, it's a tricky slope because you don't want to limit yourself so much that you end up making your story smaller than it maybe needs to be. But at the same time, those are things you have to think about, the pragmatic, lo you know, kind of logical side of it. Um, so, yeah, in my, in my experience, I was, I, I'm happy that I didn't think about it as much as I, as much as I should have. Yeah. And do now. Cool. Do you notice how she alighted over the sort of important part of that sent of, of of what she told us, which was the very first thing she wrote became a movie? Uh -huh. But we won't even talk about that for now. <laughs> so, Ben, well, you were writing. Well, did you know this was something that was for Drake, or did you know that it was something that was at least intended to be made on that level? And how did that influence your writing, both in terms of writing for a director and in terms of the writing itself? Well, writing for a director, especially writing for Drake, because he and I have been friends since we were in high school, was really, really instrumental. Um, because there's a shorthand that's uh, that you just, you know, money couldn't buy. Um, and so we were, um, we were able to communicate very easily without saying a whole lot. And as far Can as... Can you give us an example? Um, you know, like, <laughs> like, that's, that's like... <laughs> Communicating without saying much. Um, uh, 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 <laughs> what did he just tell you? <laughs> what, what, <laughs> what, what did he just tell you? We, uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> we, we communicate a lot through, uh, you know, music uh, and and visuals and establish. You know, as long as we got the, we knew what the tone was, then um, uh, then we were on the same page. And as far as like um, restricting ourselves, as far as budgets and things go, I mean, for like crazy is one thing. Like we knew we had to shoot in London, and so, like that that just had to be taken into consideration. Okay, how many people can you go to London with, and shoot, and then how how small can you make the rest of it to accommodate for that? Because it was an essential part of the story. I mean, you know, um, like. Times Square, New Year's Eve, maybe you could set that, you know, in a smaller, 
place in New York in a bar, right? Yeah. You could all you could switch that out as a writer, and it wouldn't maybe change the story, it change your production value. But like, I mean, for like crazy, we had to go to London. That was just part of the story. So we um, moved things around so that we were able to do that. Yeah. Amy, when you were writing, were you thinking about budget or locations? Were you thinking about sort of what the emotions had to be for a movie that was of a certain scale as opposed to a different scale? Um, unfortunately, no. I, I, it was the first thing I ever wrote as well, oh, and I don't, I, <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't we, think I... We, we knew this do. panel would be an eye-opener. We <laughs> didn't know it was going to be a wrist-opener. Well, if it makes you feel any better, it took many years to get made. Um, I, when <laughs> Thank I first wrote God. It, <laughs> I, I don't think I knew what scale it was when I first wrote it. I, I just wrote it. And then, um, and I think a lot of people didn't know what scale it was even when they read it because it, di it does have a lot of locations. It's, um, it's got a lot to it that you would think needs to cost a lot of money. And a lot of people thought it needed to cost a decent amount of money, not a lot, a lot of money. But um, it was set up a couple of places around town and just couldn't get made because I hadn't been thinking about all those makeability questions of how big is it, how castable is it, meaning, you know, can you put people in this movie that means something in terms of box office or foreign sales and mine was a movie about young people and it was a multicultural cast and those are just you know not things that studio executives <laughs> want to talk about um so it took me a while to realize the scale on which it had to get made that if it was going to get made i had to go out and just make it um it it was definitely a, a, a long road to that and i think Similarly, I, I learned a good lesson from it in terms of going into writing something, knowing what you're writing it for, um, how big you want it to be. Is it something you're going to go out and make, or is it something you're going to try to get somebody else to make on, on a, a larger scale? Yeah. James, uh, did, I mean, when you were writing, how conscious were you of how easy or difficult it, you were making things for James, the director, further on down the road? And also, just in terms of the, the tone register emotions of it, was the scope of the film you were going to make a consideration in, in figuring out how to craft the characters? Yeah, I mean, I think sort of going back a, f a film, I sort of had to learn as a filmmaker to let go. To get the movie made, I had to learn to let go of my ideas of what the movie was going to be. I mean, my first feature um, was called Off the Black. I would written it for very site-specific towns in North Georgia where I had grown up. And um, you know, it was literally written to the script. I think I wrote songs. I wrote all the things that were very presumptuous into the script. And um, I think even the first lines of the script, it was supposed to be um, Athens, Georgia in spring. I think the first lines describe the world as the greenest world you've ever seen. And when the line producer first, when we first started coming up with a budget, she said, how do you feel about shooting in New Mexico? <laughs> <laughs> and my answer was, New Mexico is lovely for people that are from New Mexico, but I don't know. Anyway, so we started just scouting every, I realized Georgia had no tax incentive, uh, to be short at that point. Um, it has a great tax incentive now. And we kind of eventually had to let go of this idea that, that this had to be Georgia, and then it had to be the South, and ultimately we shot in sort of rural upstate New York. And then when I met you, we met at the Sundance Screenwriters Lab, and I had, a, uh, I had adapted a short story that I was, at this point I was, because it was someone else's story, and it was site-specific to rural, like central Oregon, the high desert there. Was this Refresh, Refresh? This is Refresh, Refresh. This was not an easy film. You know, it's about young men, violence, and the psychic repercussions of war. I wanted to shoot it on film with teenagers, and it's a tough drama, and it had to be Oregon. I felt that I had to serve this writer's vision, and I spent years trying to get it financed, because I would not let it go anywhere else, and sort of almost out of frustration of, I got, you know, 50% of the budget, but couldn't get it all together. I decided that I wanted to write something that I could shoot in very specific neighborhoods in Los Angeles, <laughs> um, in Highland Park specifically. And it was sort of from, and that where budget would not be a constraint to me getting it made. Um, so that was sort of the origin of it, and then sort of finding a story that was really emotionally, um, that I could connect to and that was meaningful to me. Yeah. Jill, uh, were you thinking about producibility or, or makeability or makeability by yourself when you were writing? Your yeah, point. I think, uh, you know, by the time I wrote this film, I was I felt like I was kind of um, at the end of my rope. 
as a writer and as a creator, I had I felt that I had sort of reached a ceiling in television where I could get hired to work on other people's shows. I could I even had become a showrunner, which I had sort of thought was a goal for myself, but it was always other people's shows. I wasn't I wasn't um, making my own. I wasn't you know I didn't have my own show on there. It was other people's shows, and um, honestly, a lot of a lot of um, what happened was like a, a rageful Lena Dunham jealousy <laughs> that um, I probably wouldn't be here, but I was writing a pilot at the same time Girls was being written and HBO passed. And I remember calling my agent, who happens to be her agent, and being like, what's this other show they picked up instead of mine? He's like, oh, don't worry, it's nothing, it's just a little thing. It's a low budget something, you know. <laughs> okay. Uh, what's this film she made, Tiny Furniture? And I watched it. When her show got picked up and mine didn't, I watched Tiny Furniture and I knew why my show didn't get picked up because they couldn't see what my, they couldn't see my tone, they couldn't see my vision, they couldn't see my, they couldn't see what the show would look like. So um, I was very specifically asking myself, you know, what can I make for $40,000 in my living room? What can I make even if nobody will give me the money with my friends and a, a camera with and a 5D because I was in that place where I was I was going to do it no matter what I was going to do it whether or not I got the money so yeah I specifically wrote for the rooms that were in my house and other people's houses and the friends of mine who I knew would act in it yeah it turned out to be other people's houses luckily we had locations and and friends and also you know actors who were brought on ultimately, but th that initial charge was, I'm making it no matter what, even yeah. if I don't have any money. Did any of you, in a kind of wonderful and cynical way, say, if I write a role that's actor bait, maybe that will help me get it made? Is the, it, it, does one write for um, attracting talent, as opposed to just writing, because those are great characters? I don't know that those two things are different, ultimately. I mean, if it's a great character, it's actor bait, you know? So I think, at least for me, I don't think of it as actor bait if I'm writing it, but if, if I don't have actor bait in my script, yeah. I have a shitty script. Yeah. Uh, okay. but, well, um, when I hear actor bait, I just think about, you know. I think about Roach Motel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an odd word, sorry. Go ahead. I, I think that, you know, for me, I've definitely found little hooks like, yes, you always want to have great characters, but, you know, I, when, when I wrote this Funny or Die thing, Idiots, I was working with Zoe Saldana, and I couldn't believe she was doing this, you know, no-budget, one-day thing for the internet, and I was, I was just really amazed, and I kept thanking her and thanking her and thanking her, and, you know, finally she said, look, I've never done a scene with a woman. Hmm. And I said, what? You know, she's been in the business for so long. She said, no, I have never sat across from a table and done a scene with a woman, never. And a, a light bulb went off in my head at that moment of like, wow, women, I think especially pretty young women who aren't known as comedians, um, love this idea of doing scenes with women. And that was a direct, you know, that conversation directly allowed me to make life happen and to kind of go to these actresses and present material where, you know, it's three women and two women and all women talking to each other. And they all said, this is so fun. I never get to do this. Um, you know, they're always playing opposite men. They're always playing the love interest. They're never the ones telling the jokes. They're always the foils for the jokes. And so, you know, that was definitely something that I've now kept in my head as well. Uh, you know, just finding that, that different way in when you go to actors. Rodrigo Garcia, the writer-director, um, has made uh, many films, including um, Nine Lives, which was just, you know, uh, a kind of ensemble cast thing. And he uh, very, I think, cannily realized two things. One is that there are an astonishing number of uh, ferociously underemployed, really good female actors out there who can sometimes be available on a week or two's notice. And really, if you offer them an interesting part, will 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 leap at it even if the money is negligible as long as everybody is being treated equally and the second thing he said that he realized that was a consequence of that is if you've got if you're telling nine stories um you've got to hit the ground running each of those scenes has to begin at an emotional pitch somewhere about here because you just don't have the screen time 
when you're telling that many stories and interweaving them, to start here and slowly, 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 slowly. So he said that based on the kind of decision to write really strong parts for women, again, not as bait, but just because he thought that it would really improve his chances of getting a great cast. Mm -hmm. uh, and then to figure out, working backwards from there, sort of reverse engineering, well, what do these scenes have to be in order for me to do that thing? And the resulting script you look at, and it doesn't look as if it were cobbled together. It just looks magnificent. So I think those are sometimes things to bear in mind. I think something to add to that, too, is it doesn't, you know, the, 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 big, the most recognizable face doesn't have to be your main actor, necessarily. And sometimes in the case of working with really small budgets, um, you can find uh, an actor who, who has a couple days who wants to be in your movie, who's got a name, who's very recognizable, who's a tremendous actor. In the case of like crazy, we got a hold of Jen Lawrence for two days and it just happened to be the right window and suddenly she's in the movie and suddenly she's this supporting female character and um, that, I guess that is, that's more of a casting thing I suppose, but I mean, James too, and I look at your movie and like, Octavia Spencer being in it, and not the biggest role, but a very, like, definitely memorable role. Yeah, I mean, we, um, yeah, I mean, Mary Elizabeth Winstead, who is our lead, is certainly known, I think she's a, like, if you go to Austin, Texas, sort of <laughs> there's this nerdy fanboy base of people who know her from Scott Pilgrim, and she's in Tarantino movies, and the remake of The Thing, she plays the Kurt Russell role. She, like, she's an ass-kicking <laughs> action star, but people weren't offering her, you know, lead dramatic roles, where she's in 99% of the scenes, and she's not uh, someone's girlfriend or something where she something where she actually gets to be vulnerable and really really um, not just run from a monster and um, and she really she really brought it and sort of brought a level of professionalism to the set and sort of everyone saw what she was doing and sort of rose to the occasion but we were able to create a really lovely ensemble I mean it's her film but we created a really lovely ensemble around her with actors from like TV like Nick Offerman and Megan Mullally and Aaron Paul and then yeah Octavia Spencer who this was before the help, and I had known her from TV. From I liked her in Ugly Betty, and then in the year before, I'd enjoyed her in Dinner for Schmucks and Drag Me to Hell, where she was just always she was a career working actor who was always stealing scenes and always making things better or more specific or funny or weird. And then um, you know the world kind of caught up and realized that she's amazing, and we kind of were able to get her in the film at at the right time. We kind of lucked out. I, I want to sort of take half a step backwards. Uh, uh, the uh, Writers Guild did a panel on um, funding and, and crowdfunding uh, a few weeks back. And uh, you know that certainly is one way you can um, get a movie financed, which is you know taking money from friends that you've not yet met. Um, but um, what I want to know is sort of once all of you had decided that this was a film, either had decided immediately or had decided after years and years of frustration that this was a film to be made, what then were the concrete practical steps you took in order to figure out how much it would take to get made and then get that money together? And I think we'll start with Jill and work this way this time. Um, I had a number in my head that I wanted my movie to cost $300,000. or I wanted to make a movie for $300,000. I, I, it ended up costing more, but that was sort of the number that I was saying. And I was very specific about when I was talking to people about what I was up to, I was, um, oh, one thing that just relates to what you were just saying, there does seem to be a season where if you shoot over the summer, a lot of actors aren't working on TV shows and are kind of hanging around looking for movies to do over the summer. But th So that's like one really practical thing about making your movie appealing to actors. The summer is a really good time to, that people seem to be free. But so I had this notion in my head, I'm shooting in the summer of 2012 you know, no matter what, and uh, I'm gonna be back. I had, I had been at Sundance the previous year with a short. I'm gonna be back at the next Sundance, so I need to be done by August. That was just sort of articulating this plan, and I'm looking for $300,000. And that's what I would say to anybody who asked me what I was up to, like everybody. And I think the way that, uh, I know that the way I ended up finding my producers and the original money was at the farmer's market in Silver Lake. Uh, via a conversation with somebody I hadn't seen in a while. You know, I had given my script to my agent and she was sending it to the sort of usual suspect producers. And I said, can you throw this guy in the mix? I ran into somebody who said he's got some money for a film and his film just fell out and can you throw him into the mix? And it was that kind of total kismet thing that ended up, it was, but if I hadn't been like saying that exact thing to 
everyone it, it it wouldn't have it wouldn't have come through that way. So I think just like knowing what, if you are going to direct your movie, and if not if you're not going to direct it, if you can align with a producer or a director who has a vision for how much it can cost, and just be able to say exactly the amount of money you're looking for instead of I want to get it made, um, and that was really helpful for me. Uh, just to second what you said, I have had one assignment and one film get made out of conversations that started at the farmers market. <laughs> so. I, I would say all of you, you know, you write Monday through Saturday, but Sunday, you know what to do. <laughs> For what I'm it's serious, worth, too. Yeah. For what it's worth, Paul Mazursky is one of my favorite directors, is that outside Bob's Donuts at the farmer's market almost every single morning. Yeah. Yeah. Just so throwing that out there. <laughs> and Michael Cimino hangs out at a coffee bean on Larchmont. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think my perspective was really skewed. My first movie, I mean, um, I had written it as a two-hander that I thought I would do for nothing, and Nick Nolte starred in it. We had a, a decent budget, um, so I really believed that I should, that I was, I don't know if I thought that I was entitled to a certain amount of money, but I had an idea that, you know, I was going to make a film for a certain level and not make it below that. And then I, I heard this producer, Michael London, speak, and he was talking about producing 13 for Catherine Hardwick, and he said that what was really great about her, and I think it came from her background as a production designer and knowing how to maximize every cent was that she had a budget that she wanted to make it at, which maybe was, say, $5 million, but she knew how to make it at, th you know, four, three, two, all the way down to $20,000. Like, she knew exactly the cost-benefit of every sort of line item on that budget. Um, and there was this time between my first and second feature where all of my friends, my friend Joe Swanberg, who makes these really personal movies with no script was making a lot and then my friends Lena and Alicia came to me and said can you give us money for our Kickstarter for this movie Tiny Furniture and I was like yeah I'll give you some money and um, and then you know I sort of was like my friends are making movies for like 10 grand 20 grand 30 grand nothing and it was a real kick in the ass um, and that's sort of sort of and I, I mean Smash was written as something that we thought we could do for around that size we were lucky to have a slightly larger budget but we knew that we could make it for that I knew that I could know it that I could make it for that amount yeah. And uh, can you talk about what your budget was? It was around a half million. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Amy? Yeah. Um, I, because 96 Minutes sort of had a bit of a long life, um, in the beginning I had just written it and it, it had gotten set up right away and it was going to be a few million bucks, whatever. Kept getting set up, falling apart. I knew that this film, everybody wanted to budget it at you know between two and three million dollars and there was just no way we were going to get two and three two or three million dollars to make a movie about you know that just with a young multicultural cast it wasn't going to happen um it came together in a strange way for me but one it basically in that i had cast before i had producers or or anything and my mandate was, what is, the, what is the least amount of money I need to get this made? And I landed around that $300,000 mark. And it was really the producers that I ended up going to and saying, hey, can you help, get, help me get this made? And they said, we think we can come up with three hundred. dollars Now, can you do it for that? And I honestly, it probably could never have been done for that. But I just said yes. And saying yes got the train going you know that that meant okay we're gonna make this movie for three hundred thousand dollars and it sounds like like you we didn't actually make it for three hundred thousand dollars but it was saying yes to that lowest number that somebody comes at you with gets the whole thing going Ben? yeah i mean i, I think I'd, I'd sooner reference the movie that came before like crazy which is this really lo-fi comedy called douchebag and um we did it, I think all in all, we, we spent about, it was about 30 grand on the budget, but it was the case of like, well, what are we gonna be able to get? How much can we make it for? And we, we thought really naively we could make it for like 10 grand. And um, this is a movie with a lot of improvisation where we had to go back and do pickups and fill in story holes and just didn't account for a lot of things. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, um, Eventually, it ended up costing about 30, but it was a case of like, well, what do we have to work with? And how's that going to affect the film? And we realized, okay, it's going to have a certain aesthetic just by virtue of it costing this much. It's going to be handheld. There are going to be no lights. There's, you know, um, there's going to be sequences that are just music sequences because we're stealing shots and we can't have dialogue. Um, and so it, that, was, that was just a case of working with what you have. 
But I would like just to emphasize for the audience that you can make a feature film for 30000 The amount of money that many films spend on making the budget, you can take that money and make the film for that. I mean, you, you, can, you can make it for, I mean, you could make a feature for ten grand probably, but you're just going to, what, what you lack in money, you're going to have to make up for in, in energy, enthusiasm, and, and going crazy, basically. Um, so, I, I mean, it, it can be done for sure, but it will affect what your movie is and how it turns out. Right, but you're going to go crazy making a movie anyway, yeah, no matter anyway. what your budget yeah, level. Just gonna and Jim Cameron always feels like they don't give him, that $200 million is not enough to make the movie that he wants to make. So as long as you're going to go crazy anyway, you may as well just find the amount of money that you can get and make your movie for that, I think. Kat, what was your experience in, in um, For me, it's always been get the actors first before there's a producer, before anybody. And, you know, with Life Happens, I was old friends with Kristen Ritter, and I had just done The Funnier Die with Kate Bosworth, and I went to them, and then Kristen was friends with Rachel Bilson. And once we had that uh, assembled, suddenly the agencies were taking us seriously, whereas before they hadn't. Um, and then the second film I made with Kate, again and we kind of said we're going to make this movie for fifty thousand dollars and you know so it started again with her and we kind of knew with her attached we couldn't get a million but we could get you know fifty a hundred thousand um and then you know i the, the last film i just finished was on a bigger level but it was the exact same thing you know we had justin long and evan rachel wood and they said you need more we went out we got vince vaughn sam rockwell they said you need more i mean <laughs> the, the, it, it, it was crazy and it's a it's a you know, it's a small budget movie. And we ended up, you know, Brendan Fraser for a day and Peter Dinklage for a day. And they kept saying, what, we need more, we need more. And it was like a joke. It was like, how many huge actors can you have in a movie? And yet you still, you still need more of these actors to get the financing. Um, they need 23 of them. It was, <laughs> it's, not, it's not far off. You know, it ended up being just so much fun, but it was kind of mind-blowing in that process, going, wait, this isn't enough? You know, you, and, and it's all the foreign sales. I mean, yeah, so it's always been for me, like, getting the actors first, and then everything else kind of falls into place. Yeah. Uh, I want to talk now about the sort of... Um, tension between uh, writers and directors, even when, maybe especially when they're the same person. Um, I, I, I remember um, uh, some years back uh, at the Sundance Screenwriting Lab, I think this was a little bit before you were there, James, um, there was a young uh, filmmaker, David Gordon Green, who had just made uh, George Washington, which is an ex astonishing film, and I really urge everybody here to see it. And he had a script called All the Real Girls. And I remember the press release that Sundance put out saying, announcing the lab, here are our projects, you know, the script, All the, uh, All the Real Girls. And they were saying, you know, David Gordon Green has written a work of, and it was kind of great. And then sometimes, because sometimes good things happen to good people, as we're certainly learning tonight, uh, that film got made. And uh, I remember the press release that Sundance had in the Sundance Film Festival announcing that, which was, all the real girls directed by David Gordon Green. As if the writer that they had supported, nurtured, trumpeted, had to somehow sort of, you know, slink away behind the curtain in order for David Gordon Green, the director, to have his full due. And, um, you know, I think it's reflexive. I don't think it's malicious. I think it just happens. You know, uh, a filmmaker is a writer director, is a director, is, well, you know. And so I, I guess the questions I want to ask are um, how much, um, when you were actually making the film, did you curse your writer self for not having given you what you needed to make it? And how did you resolve those differences between what you ideally see on a page when you're writing something, the movie that screens in your head, uh, with the movie then you were actually on set or on location making? Sort of, you know. Did you tear your hair out? Did you revel in the fact that you got to rewrite yourself? I mean, how did that, that process feel from the inside? I can, I can talk about that a little bit. I think sure. because I was a TV writer, I was really used to, um, you know, colored pages coming yeah. out every day. And so I was just, uh, my producers and my line producer were really surprised where I was publishing new pages every day. 
that they weren't asking for. <laughs> <laughs> because the director wanted pages that, the, that weren't in the script. You know, I think once I started directing, I was able to see certain scenes were too long. And you know, I, the, the night, the, a few days before, I would start to think my way through, okay, we're actually gonna shoot this. The actors are gonna show up and the cameras are gonna have to be somewhere. And God, this is, this is way too much. And it really can just be said with this. And you know, in much the same way that I think all my writing is intuitive, and you sort—I sort of would just you know receive or know the right way to do something. The new pages would um, appear in my head, like, oh, this is that scene, and my first impulse would always be like, oh, ignore it. That's just some weird thought. You're just like causing trouble by writing new pages. But then it would, the, you know, the new lines and the new shape of the scene would just keep pushing every day and I would go, okay, there, I'm sorry, I told you that double blue was the last set of revisions, <laughs> but double pink are coming out tomorrow, sorry guys. Um, Canary, goldenrod. All of them. <laughs> I think we got to double whatever, the double buff at the end. Um, so yeah, I learned so much as a director that um, as a writer I had to provide some, you know, I always say the script is really a map that shows, yeah, a map that allows you know investors and people to get excited in the beginning, and then it's a map that shows, you know, the locations, people, where to turn up, and where the trucks were to park. But um, that never became more clear to me than when I was a director, where, you know, I threw out page after page after page of words. Yeah. I guess James? for me, um, you know, I'll, I'll spend years working on a single script. That being said, my favorite films as a film goer were developed generally with some level of improvisation. Um, so I'm pretty, I'm obsessive when I'm writing it, but then, I mean, I, I treat everyone as a collaborator. That's how I see the actors. And I try to surround myself with people that I think are smarter and more talented than me. And then to then micromanage them and force them to sort of um, do exactly what I ask them to do is really short-sighted. So I mean, I always sort of make a pact at the head. Once I've found all oh, that cliche that, you know, 90% of directing actors for film or TV is in casting, I really believe it. And I try to cast brilliant actors with great imaginations. And I tell them at the head that, you know, they can do or say anything they want in front of the camera. They just have to agree to do anything that I ask them to do. And it sort of creates this foundation of trust. Um, and it's always worked out pretty well. The interesting thing is the film I made after Smash, uh, The Spectacular Now, which was at Sundance this year, was adapted from a really great novel. And I didn't write it. It came, the script sort of came to me from this great writing team, Scott Newsetter and Mike Weber, who had written 500 Days of Summer. And you know, I was very upfront with everyone that I allow actors to really riff. But I felt suddenly I felt actually really protective of the script. Um, I really, okay. because someone else had written it, and I've I know what it is for writers to be abused. I just was constantly, in the, in the beginning, sort of tiptoeing and making sure everyone was okay with just the words kind of evaporating and changing once we had real human beings saying them. Yeah. I mean, I've always found there's this weird thing, like if you're writing and you're writing a, a line of dialogue and you can't come up with the right word, you just know that there's a right word, but you, it's just not dropping down, whatever word you put in instead is cruddier. But when you're working with actors and you have this line reading in your head about how they should say it, and they say it in a completely different way, it's always better. <laughs> you know, I think there's something about sort of happy accidents in in acting and sad accidents in writing that, that, that kind of <laughs> are, are kind of you know complementary. What was yeah, your? I mean, I definitely yeah. agree with both of these guys. I mean, I think um, once you get on set, at least for me, I I could never imagine being very precious about the words anymore because you do you have these this whole living breathing world in front of you that you have to let you know let loose and and your job as as a director is to kind of encourage that and to make sure that they have everything they need to make it feel real it's always shocking to me when we get through a whole scene and they actually spoke the words that were written, you know, and it worked, you know, that's kind of amazing. But most of the time it is the, you know, go with it. If something comes to you, if you want to do it a different way, do it that way. Um, and so it, it is, it's sort of your writer self steps aside while always listening to anything new that's happening to kind of go, oh, that gave me a new idea, let's try it this way. Um, but yeah, I, I do think that there has to be that balance within yourself as writer or director. Ben, you're in a slightly different situation because you're in a more collaborative situation with the director, but how does, how does that work out for you guys? Well, I think the trick is get real friendly with the editor. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, kind of kidding. But, um, kind of. I, I kind of. Uh, I, you know, gosh, 
let me see. I think that, um, I mean, it's already been touched upon, but like the main thing to realize is that if you're writing a screenplay, your method of delivery is not a bound tome <laughs> and that it's going to change and just accept that. And, and there are battles that are worth fighting and know what those battles are and know what you want to hold on to and what you will fight for. Um, at the end of the day, the best idea has to win and you have to be open to that and realize that you're giving it to somebody else. Um, you're giving it to the director and then you're giving it to the editor and whoever else has their hands on it, the actors. It's, um, I, I don't know, it's, a, it's an exercise in letting go in a way. Yeah, but I think, you know, you let go in order to get something much grander than you could have achieved all by yourself. Oh, positively, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, I mean, a blueprint of a ship is a blueprint of a ship. Where's the ship, you know? <laughs> Who cares about the blueprint at the end of the day? It's necessary and needs to be there and needs to be well constructed. But, yeah, your, your method of delivery is through other people, is something else. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, those of us who write screenplays often forget that. It's sort of like, um, you know, we're wearing a bathrobe and there's a line of letters down the left and a line of numbers across the top. And, you know, we're walking up to people saying, will you scratch J11? But it's a lot more fun in life to go around not wearing a bathtub and just every once in a while somebody scratches your back. I think it's, I, I mean, <laughs> that sounds great. Um, <laughs> I think, I think it is like collaboration from the get-go. I mean, I, I tend to write with a partner, you, at least the films that have been produced that I've had a hand in have been co-written. And um, I think collaboration, not just with your co-writer, but as many people as possible that are part of that process, um, as long as you trust them and you want their insight, I, I welcome that as a writer. Yeah. Okay. Um, I wrote uh, my first television pilot this year. And Congratulations. Thank you. Going, going into it, I'd heard all these nightmare stories about development and, <clears throat> oh, you're going to hate it. Everyone's going to be telling you what to do and they're going to change everything. And, and somebody gave me this advice that I thought was amazing. It was this producer who'd done a lot of movies within the studio system. And he said, hold on to you know a, a little bit of a secret. What is the core of this story? Why is this important for you to tell? And they can change every single line. They can change the characters. But if you hold on to that, never tell anybody what that is. Because as soon as they know what it is, they'll want to change it. <laughs> um, but I thought that it was such wonderful advice. And I was able to go into this experience. And it, it did end up happening. You know, I ended up changing all the characters and the whole dynamic. But I had this little theme, if you will, which was the impetus for me to tell this story, why I wanted to tell this story. And it didn't matter what they changed superficially. And I actually enjoyed it. It was like a challenge. And just like holding on to that little heart, um, you know, that was like my little secret made it really fun. And, and I think that, like, I, I think what everyone's saying and what everyone shares here is this very collaborative spirit. And I love what you said about just surrounding yourself with people who are smarter than you, because that really is the key. Um, is you know, trusting people who are good at what they do, and that allows you to let go. Yeah. Um, I want to now talk a little bit about sort of what you, you know, we talked about what you did after, what one does after one writes a script, and now I want to talk a little bit about what one does after one's made a film. Um, you know, as I think the people on this panel can tell you, as many of you can tell, can tell us, uh, the, uh, barriers to actually making a film, I think, have never been lower, certainly financially. I mean, you can make a film with uh, a cell phone using a Super 8 app. I, I, you know, I think when the light bulb went on over my head, it was two or three years ago, when the top two grossing films in the United States of America, uh, the Michael Jackson concert movie and Paranormal Activity, uh, were both shot with consumer cameras. You know, so, I mean, you, you, you can do that. But in, in a weird way, even though the financial barriers to making a film in some ways have never been lower, uh, and even though technologically distribution has never been easier, like, you know, hit send, um, the barriers to distribution in a, in a weird way seem never, ne 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 seem never to have been higher. I mean, maybe there's just a lot of noise in the culture and maybe there's just a lot of options for things for people to do other than watch TV and go to movies. Uh, one of the ways that people sort of mediate between having a film and having a film in many theaters is the festival circuit. 
And I'm wondering for those of you who, you know, rode the bare back of that bucking bronco, <laughs> what that ride was like. Kat, did you do that? Um, I, I rode, <laughs> yes, I did. I, um, yes. Uh, Oh, it was funny with the first film. You know, we did the festivals, we sold it. And, I, you know, I like, I think most first time directors was like, you know, I must have this theatrical release. And then we got the theatrical release and it was like, oh, I want more cities and more screens. And, um, you know, it was kind of like an ego thing. It was like the more cities and the more screens, the better of a director I am. And um, that's true. <laughs> it, it, it's a, well, to an extent, but but I, I mean, I think addressing your question, things are changing so fast that even the people distributing don't know exactly how things are changing. And so, you know, we found ourselves in this situation where we had a pretty, you know, for such a tiny movie, we had a pretty wide distribution. Um, and it, it ended up kind of being dispersed uh, among all these little theaters, and there was no real advertising behind it, so people didn't even know. I mean, my mother didn't even know where it was playing in, you know, the town she lives in, for real. Did you tell her? Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I did. <laughs> I did, but she couldn't find it, because it was, like, in the mall, and, you know, and... It, it, and it, I mean, I couldn't find it when I went to try to see it in the theater. No joke. And so, you know, coming off of that experience, you know, with the next film, when they started talking about theatrical release, I was, I was very nervous. And I, I, I was kind of like, let's really look at this. And how do you take a small film that doesn't have, um, you know, a lot of financial backing for the advertisement. And, you know, and so the next film we're doing, we're opening it in, you know, very select small theaters in New York and L.A. and starting there. And maybe that's all it'll do. And I'll be happy um, if that's all it does. Because now, when you say we, you're not self-distributing this. No, no. We, we, we got distribution. Yeah. But, you know, I, and they were so funny. They're like, a director who doesn't you know, want a huge theatrical release. And I said, yeah, but I want everyone who has points in the film to make money. I, I, I actually don't want to spend all of the money we have on, you know, this distribution. Um, and and so, it, you know, it's really been an interesting thing. And every, every year it changes. I mean, year by year it is changing in the, you know, releasing things the same time on VOD that you do in the theater. Yeah. And people are really just working it out. So it's not this old model, you know, when you're dealing with the smaller films, you really do have to do your research. And um, it, it was really interesting and to kind of take the ego out of it and just go, what, what is, how is this gonna reach an audience but also make money for everybody who put their time, effort, and money into the film? Yeah. Ben? Um, I mean, honestly, I don't know if I have my finger on the pulse of this one as much, but I can tell a second-hand story. Um, <laughs> and that is... Uh, a f Please. Okay. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Mike Mohan, uh, yeah. he did... Uh, any of you in the audience know Mike Mohan or his films? He, he directed Save it, the Day. If you do nothing else tonight, go home and d d familiarize and do yourself. This. I mean, he's self-distributed. Yeah. Um, his first movie, which was called One Too Many Mornings. He was at Sundance, didn't get picked up, and was like, I'm just going to sell this thing. Yeah. And um, I don't know what it did for him, but uh, he got to but make you, another movie. And you got a copy, I got a copy. I, got, I bought and a it's copy. it's a great film. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I think I was really surprised when it came to uh, distribution with 96 Minutes. I, you know, I had it in my head. Theaters and cities and all that same story um, and that was the biggest thing when we were when distributors were talking to us at South by Southwest you know they here are the deals we're talking about and I was all about you know well, what's the best theatrical deal and all that kind of stuff and what I learned in the end um, we ended up getting a great deal but what they wanted to do was they wanted to do this prime VOD release where they release the movie on VOD a week or two before the theatrical release so this sounded horrible to me. <laughs> I thought, who is going to go to the theater when you could just click a button on your TV and watch it? And even if you're not going to watch it, if you've seen it, advertises VOD, does it now seem like something you don't want to go to the theater and do? And they kind of explained to us, well, you know, it's prime VOD, so we're charging 10 or $12 to download it and watch it, and no one's going to do that. So it's really just advertisement. 
So we're like, okay, that's <laughs> fine. <laughs> it's advertising for the theatrical. Well, lo and behold, we did the Prime VOD and people started clicking. And within the first two weeks, we made a ton of money. And all of a sudden, I went, oh my God, we've, we've got something that's really happening here. A, an incredible number of people are seeing this that would never see it in the theater. Who cares about theatrical? Yeah. Um, and it was really, it was a real eye opener for me to, to just be open to all these new ways of getting your film out there that you know give you an opportunity to both get in front of a lot of eyes and affect a lot of people. Um, a lot of people who can't get out to the theater, don't have access, don't have whatever it is, or won't. Um, and then also make your money back and get your investors you know, some profits. So it was really kind of keeping yourself open and not getting stuck to this idea that it's all about you know, the theater that you're in um, and you know the 20 people that are in that theater, you know, and you can you can really reach people or in two hmm? the, Or the two people in that theater. <laughs> the two, yeah. Your parents, but um, <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so I, I mean I really it's changing so much and I think it's really it's really a great thing yeah. in, in 2008 I had a film that was theatrically released and I was asked to do a Q&A at the Sunset 5 before it became I guess the Sundance or whatever it is now. And I was really, really ecstatic, you know, because this was like something that I'd written that was like in the movie theater, you know, and I was going to go to the movie theater, and I was going to stand up in front of the movie theater, and I was going to be a hero. And when I got there, I got up from the parking structure, and there was like this line of like 50 or 60 people, and I was like so happy. <laughs> and I, then I got to my own little theater, and it was, uh, how do you say, a, a bit more gently attended. <laughs> um, <laughs> There were a couple of my friends. It was nice. Uh -huh. um, and um, then I walked out. And uh, as I walked out after the, the screening, there were now about 150 to 170 people in line, uh, all waiting there to see Poultrygeist uh -huh. from Troma. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I learned something about film marketing that day. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know. Uh, and like every other good lesson in life, it you know starts with humiliation mm -hmm. <laughs> and ends with a chicken. <laughs> Jim, what was you, you? You've now not only you know been to Sundance what three times now, uh, but you just go and you win a prize and you go and you win a prize. It's just like um, I mean, I'm I'm pretty pragmatic about my expectations. I mean, once the movie premieres at the festival. I don't necessarily expect to see any money after that from, from anyone, from any distributor. Um, I'm probably pretty cynical about it. But I mean, I started out making short films and um, before I did features, and what I really loved about doing shorts was doing sort of the circuit of regional film festivals where you actually get to, to meet people, um, you know, throughout the Southeast and the Northeast and everywhere, everywhere that's not just Sundance, LA Film Festival, Toronto, New York, whatever. Um, and then I had two features in a row, um, you know, where I was very, very fortunate, um, you know, to be able to get them into Sundance and to sell them. But in both cases, the distributor basically, you know, acquired them and said, we're going to sit on it until the fall or winter and then kind of release it in an awardsy type thing and not do the sort of all of the festival. So I really didn't get that. And, and which, and meanwhile. An awardsy type thing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I mean, yeah. like, you know, last year, so I mean, it, you know, I was very lucky. Smash got picked up by Sony Classics and, um, and all, and they released it in October, and they didn't, you know, they, they went to the Toronto Film Festival, yeah. a couple of other high-profile fall festivals, but while all my friends, um, you know, who had been at Sundance with movies like Compliance or Safety Not Guaranteed or Beasts of Southern Wild, they were really doing every single festival through the spring and summer, and it just feels like a fun kind of rock and roll thing. I was just like, well, my film's coming out in 10 months, and, um, and you know, and it is, it, it's a huge, hugely... Um, uh, amazing thing to be able to stand up in front of a theater and have people pay for tickets and for your short, short run <laughs> um, to have them come. But what I'm really happy about and really enjoying but not sleeping much with is that, um, you know, our distributor for the film that I had at Sundance this year, you know, we talked about the release date and I was pretty emphatic that I wanted a summer release date, yeah. sort of counter program it. And they're doing every, every festival and I'm going. I mean, I'm, there's 12 festivals I'm going to in the month of April. So it's just wow. nonstop. Because the thing is, at the end of the day, I mean, I want to make the movie that I want to make, and then ultimately I want to have a dialogue. I enjoy having a dialogue with people, whether they love it or hate it or anything in between. It's really fun for me because most of, you know, writing scripts is really lonely. Editing can be really lonely and really brutal, and it can all be really brutal. Um, you get to be around people on set, but you're stressed, and there's a real pleasure, I think, in talking to people and 
just hearing what they think about the thing that you made. Jill, uh, did you do this? Um, yeah, I'm in this sort of like stupid idiot position of, of, tr of believing that there's going to be people in the theater right now where uh, I went through this huge learning curve when the movie, after the movie premiered at Sundance, learning about what are basically the three options for distribution right now. One is called Day and Date. It comes out online the same, it comes out on VOD the same day it comes out in the theaters. Another one's called Ultra or Prime VOD. So they put it on VOD months, weeks, at some point before it comes out on VOD and charge a premium for it. And then there's theatrical. Um, and heard a lot of these things, you know, um, don't bother with the theatrical because you never know if people are going to turn up in the theaters or if you just, you know, even for a huge movie, there's empty movie theaters all over the country. But um, ultimately we found a distribution company that has a vision for the distribution and wanted to go for it and wanted to go for the theatrical release and um, more cities, more screens. I'm like where you were. Um, still kind of believing that, you know, um, it can turn into kids are all right. That's, you know, that's what I, that's what I imagined when I wrote it. That's what I hoped when I directed it. That's what I felt at Sundance. And against all odds, we're going to like throw the long, throw the football, you know, for the Hail Mary and see what happens. And, um, yeah, it'll be on VOD three months later and, you know, cross our fingers that, that, the, that there's money to be made. But we're taking, we're taking the risk. But interestingly, like, everybody is, um, you know, so many people are making sure that everybody gets it. It's a huge risk to attempt this in a film without big stars. Yeah. Um, I, I want to throw it open to questions from the audience now. We've got some time for that. So is there, I think there are people with microphones. Yes? <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask, uh, you guys are doing VOD. What kind of websites? What what are the where are uh, you guys sending the audience to? Because I don't, I mean. Yeah, well, the the VOD audience is Netflix. It's on demand. It's those Barker ads that you see when you're just like flipping through in theaters, coming to theaters. So it's sort of like what comes with your Direct TV. Um, and then there's you know Netflix. There's um, iTunes and some people you know like for example the way Louis C.K. distributed his concert film. Some people are arranging, like it's happening right now where you just build your own website. You I think there's a, I forget what it's called, but there's something, there's a, there's a whole mechanism right now for artists to actually stream the movie and, char and you know, the money goes into your bank account when people buy it. You know, the question ultimately is the same as it is with any product. Um, the marketing, the, the P&A, you know, what's, what is spent on advertising and marketing press, it has to be there for people to know about it. So you can do it yourself, but by, you know, working with a distribution company, it's people who are investing time, energy, and, and you know, vision into how to get people to talk about your film. Right. So L I think buying the website and streaming it is a great idea, but it may not be enough. Louis C.K. was very transparent about all of the monies involved in, in his decision to, to sell his own film that way. Uh, so I think that's worth reading up on, but I think we all know that if you're Louis C.K., you already have a brand, and what is driving people to your website is you. Uh, and for the rest of us, I think, um, you know, there are various other strategies to make up for the deficit that we're not, you know, um, common names in, in, in the larger culture. Anybody else have thought on, no? did anybody have their own individual dedicated website? I know Mike Mohan did. Uh, or did you work through Netflix, iTunes, those things? Yeah, we our, our distributor did all the deals, and um, I think where we were most successful, sort of in that first week of Prime VOD, um, where we kind of just came out with a bang that we weren't expecting, was through the Barker ads on like Comcast and Time Warner. We're running little Barkers with Brittany Snow and Evan Ross, who starred in the film, and people were just downloading it from there. We didn't come out on Netflix and iTunes. Um, and, and those kind of pay sites until after the theatrical release. The, the prime VOD window for us was just the, through the you know, cable and direct TV and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think you should be excited about your movie you know, coming out. And what I was saying was, it's like you need someone with a vision. We got bought by Universal. In Universal Slate, we are at the very bottom because we're this teeny tiny film. Um, 
full of TV stars. And if someone had said, you know, who, who's going to buy this movie? The audiences on iTunes, on Netflix, bought the movie a lot. But it's not a thea you know, it's not kind of the movie that people are going to go to the theater to see. So it really is about having that vision and kind of looking at it and going, wow, I have, you know, five pretty big TV stars in this film. It's probably better on television, you know, where people know these people and they're going to see that banner and they're going to want to watch Kristen Ritter and Rachel Bilson and those people they watch you know, on television and not go to the theater. And, and so it really is kind of like, that's how I go into it now, is having more of that vision. And um, yeah, and you know, we were, oh, Universal, huge company. But <laughs> think about it again, when you're the tiny, tiny movie with the big company, you, you might be better off going with a smaller company that's really gonna be passionate and you're one of five movies on their slate, not one of 100. Yeah. If anybody's interested in just following all of the now hundreds of different modalities of, of distributing film, I would recommend following Ted Hope's Twitter feed because Ted's an iconic independent producer who is also savvy enough to understand that the times are changing. And he uh, is supple and interesting, and every month he's got a sort of whole, a slightly different angle on how to think about this. And I find it sort of keeps, keeps, me, keeps me awake. Uh, you had a question. I'm curious, uh, possibly telling us what might have surprised you along the way, whether it be good or bad, something that just you never expected as you were either going through your career or this film. An anecdote. <laughs> James, I know you've been surprised. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm surprised. I mean, what's been surprising me recently is that people... Um, you know, Smash came out last fall and then just came out on DVD and Blu-ray, but it's apparently it's on airplanes everywhere. I mean, there was a very strange dialogue that I had um, just as the thing was finishing being in theaters where people from Sony called and said, we have great news. Um, there's an airline that wants to show at Main Cabin, meaning, like, you don't have a choice whether to watch this movie. It's going to be forced on you. And it was Air Iberia. And the movie... <laughs> the movie... The movie's an R-rated movie that involves a lot of, like, F-bombs and someone's an alcoholic who like pees on the floor and smokes crack and pukes in front of kids and basically there was this they said we want to involve you in this process but um, <laughs> of editing your movie I'd already done a pan and scan which is pretty brutal um, and they basically said that every everything that I just mentioned they wanted to cut out which really they're not digressions they're plot points and it became this really interesting conversation I know some directors don't even participate in these things and I started to understand why because in this case I was like what you're talking about is turning the movie into a form of Dadaism, where it seems schizophrenic, <laughs> and you will antagonize people flying to Madrid, and they'll be like, why is this dumb, <laughs> nonsensical movie like playing in front of me? And I kind of, and I realized they had good intentions. Um, so I don't know, I thought it was just going to be on that airline, but apparently it's on airlines everywhere. I don't know if it's that version, or if, because when you get to choose, maybe they, it's not the sort of boulderized version of the film, but just people saying, hey, I was, I was on my way back from Reykjavik, and I, I saw your movie, and that's really fun to me. I mean, I, I'm i just excited for people to see the movie, however it gets to them. I mean, theatrical is lovely, and that's I grew up worshiping movies in movie theaters. That's how I'd prefer people to see it, whether it's at a festival or paying or, you know, in a first-run theater. But um, I'm happy how everyone sees the movie. And isn't Iberia Airlines the perfect place to turn your narrative into a Bunuel film? <laughs> exactly, exactly. That was probably their idea. <laughs> Anybody else surprised by anything along the way? Good, well, bad. I, I will. I will say that like uh, I had another feature that I had been had been sort of almost made for many years that a studio had bought, and I tried to get back, and then I rewrote it and kind of renamed it and made it smaller. And I, I would say I was like pushing it uphill for ten years, and when this one seemed like it was going to happen, it had its own velocity, where I w I kind of wished I had known what it felt like when something was going to happen, and. Oh. It's sort of like it's it's going on its own. It, I realize now that if you are pushing a rock uphill and you look you know behind you and nobody's helping you push the rock, like it's the wrong rock. Get out of the way. Let the rock fall. Um, find something else where you're not put. You know if 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 there's if if it's meant to be, it sort of takes on its own momentum. And there are people with you who want it to happen. Actors want to do it. Producers want to help. People want to put money in. People want to bring lunch to the set. Um, try to be aware of whether or not 
And I, I think that's really smart. And I think to piggyback on that, a lot of that also can be timing. Um, yeah. You know, you can be pushing, 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 pushing. And then when you finally go, I think I've got the wrong boulder, I'm going to get out of the way. Suddenly you could be someplace else pushing another boulder and that boulder starts to move on its own. Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, that's certainly what happened for me with 96 Minutes. It, it completely put itself together when it finally got going. And we'd spent years and many studios and, you know, the whole, the whole nine trying to make it happen. And then one day it decided to happen. And, you know, then I got on its train. So I, I think that's really smart. Always pay attention to kind of what's, what's happening. And it is surprising. I mean, it's, the whole process is a surprise. I mean, I think every day, and I think everybody knows that. You think something's going to happen. You think it's going one way, and it, and, and it goes another. But um, it kind of also links into what we were all saying about the difference between writing and directing. When you get on set, letting it breathe and letting it take life, you know, the whole process is about that. It's about watching and listening and knowing what's happening with this thing that you've created and, you know, when to, when to run with it, when to push it, and when to get out of its way. Questions? Um, I have a question. Um, it's for, uh, for, can you hear me, for Amy. Um, so uh, I have a project that uh, potentially can tap into, um, or hopefully reach like a Latino and gay audience. And so, you know, watching your film and seeing that, you know, it has um, multicultural cast and, and you, you discussed, um, you know, the difficulties in sort of putting that out there. Um, did you, what was your experience in either reaching out to targeted financiers or, I'm not sure if it's been released, but, you know, reaching out to certain populations to get an audience? Does that make, you know, is that a Yeah, it does make sense. Um, we, uh, in terms of fi the financiers for it, were a compl it was a completely unlikely, it was a bunch of white dentists in Atlanta that basically <laughs> ended up funding the thing. So, you know, funding wise, we, 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 mo <laughs> it's true. You we don't have to floss all your teeth, just the ones <laughs> you don't want to lose. Um, you know, it, that, the, the multicultural aspect of, of the film was, the big roadblock everywhere we went to get it financed. Um, people kept saying there isn't an audience, there isn't an audience. Now, I have another film that's coming out, and 96 Minutes was released, and we did try to kind of do certain things to, to target audiences, but again, you know, we, we had a very small PA budget, and ultimately the movie in, in its release took on a life of its own on this whole sort of VOD world. I have a film that's coming out that um, that's at Screen Gems um, that is Taraji Henson and Idris Elba, and it's a mostly black cast, and that's with Will Packer producing. And Will has had a tr tremendous success, um, kind of targeting the African American audience and especially African American women. He he did. Um, what obsessed on the yard takers think like a man these are his films and um there is a way to do i mean he's really figured out how to do that with that audience there really i think there's a lot to be said for reaching out directly to your audience if you know where they are and and how to get to them you know where they are online where they're you know um they're looking for their their content to consume so i would say that in terms of Finding your audience, it's very smart to kind of, to really do that directly. Financing wise, I think it's just as hard as anything else. You know, you kind of try to find your dentists. I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, over there. A lot of us as writers are Michael. obsessed with the idea of the set because we spend so much time dreaming about it. <laughs> do each of you have your own experience on the set that we haven't talked about where you learned something about what it means to be in production that would benefit everybody to know going into it. Your own experience, a day on the set, something that happened that we could all learn from. I think your sense of time is, is a lot different when you're writing versus when you're on a set. Um, mm. When you're writing, especially if, if you're just writing a spec script, your timeline could be 10 weeks, it could be four months, it could be four years, it could be anything. 
and you know there's not a ticking clock where cash is literally burning in front of your eyes and that is what it feels like when you're making a film a low budget film I mean the film that you saw the trailer for we shot in 19 days um, so I mean it was you have to just plan obsessively and then coordinate a lot of people and try to get them to synchronize to make something um, in a very short amount of time I mean it's sort of you know, sets can be highly functional or highly dysfunctional. There's a reason most rock and roll bands, even with four or five creative people, don't last more than a few years. Imagine multiplying that and having 20 or 40 or 60 people. Um, it can be pretty pretty nuts, but you really learn um, the value of, of just time management, I think, when you're on a set. Yeah. And, and I would also say that, you know, just to f follow up on what James said, the clock ticks very loudly when you're actually on the set, so anything you can move to either side of that period, you should, because you'll have enough to do. Yeah, and also regarding um, efficiency on the set, I um, studied directing with a woman named Joan Sheckle. She does directing workshops here in Los Angeles. She's amazing. She's where I was, um, point, I was pointed in her direction when I didn't get into the screenwriting lab or the directing lab at Sundance, and I really wanted to workshop my film. Um, so for people who are looking to workshop their material with somebody who really takes people to the next stage of directing, she was amazing for me. But she did teach one really important thing that totally helped me, which was to not paint your whole film with the same brush and to not look at your schedule as if the whole film should be shot with the same brush. Pick your five or six um, really important scenes that you know a great a, a good movie has you know one good scene and a great movie has two good scenes and three amazing scenes are can be a masterpiece so take those great scenes spend your time on them stand up for the fact that no we're staying here till midnight but only on those six scenes the rest of the scenes you know if you need to, to figure out a way to shoot them in one but you know figure out what's important take a stand for that um, those are where your most important film moments are, and enter enter the month or whatever it is that you're doing, knowing that those are those are the gems that you're trying to protect with your schedule. That's great advice. Anybody else? Next question. I was just curious. Um, based on everything you talked about till now, um, how many of you did end up with actual producer credit? Because you seemed like you separated this initially. And then, if I understood correctly, you passed it along to someone else. Um, if you ended up with producer credit, whether it was the first film or the, or, you know, the last film you made, how did you balance the producer responsibilities with the, I'm going to say more the, the you know, writer-director, or let's say director responsibilities? Well, I've been really striving to not be a producer because of that. You know, I remember with my first film, I fought, fought, fought to get that producer credit because I felt like I'd shepherded it and I'd brought it to where it was. And then you do find yourself being pulled in different directions and dealing with financial things and having people come to you and tell you things that you really don't want to hear when you have to be focusing on the story and taking care of your actors and, you know. Um, and I just had the experience with the last film of not being a producer and... Um, it was great, especially <laughs> especially once you get into post and they just call you and and ask you questions and say go here, as opposed to being the person who's organizing the film festival stuff and making sure everybody gets there. Um, you know, I think ideally you get the producer credit, but then you have very strong producers that you work with, um, or you just focus on the writing and directing. That's. I also think that, you know, especially when it comes to making your first feature, and if we're, if we're talking about making a film with what you have, that it, sometimes it's just a necessity to, to wear those many hats and to own that and to say, okay, I have to wear these several hats. I'm, I've mentioned this film, Douchebag, that we did that I, was, I got a producing credit on. There was someone who was um, leading that parade, but and I was more of a a task person as far as producing goes, but it was a matter of, okay, who knows someone who, who knows someone who owns an art gallery? And it's like, all right, I do. Who knows someone who does, I do. Okay, so you're kind of a producer now, Ben, um, <laughs> is how that worked. <laughs> um, so, you know, sometimes you just gotta wear all the hats. 
Somebody actually told me something interesting as a director, which was a surprise to me, which was that you don't want to you don't want a producer career. If you're the writer and director, you don't want a producer credit because it appears to the community like you had to throw your own party. And that was a big deal for me. And so, yeah, I realized, okay, I'm not going to be producing this. It's really important to get great producers. There are people out there who love producing as much as we love writing and directing and to you know find them and let them do their thing. Um, but then, you know, shortly, you know, within the pre-production, I realized, and this came a lot from reading this book that came with the Cassavetes box set, <laughs> which I would read all the time about how he looked at being a director. He sort of had this notion that, okay, so you don't have the producer title because you don't want it, but you actually still are the producer. You're the main producer. You're the EP. You're the line producer. Your vision needs to keep this boat going forward every day and all the time. And he even said something that kept me going one day when it seemed like it was all going to fall apart, which is like, as the artist, it's your job to figure out how to get the money people to let you make the art with their money, which is totally producerial and incredibly annoying, <laughs> mm. but your responsibility, because it's you're, you're the only person who cares about the art. Everybody else cares about the money. It's your job to figure out how to get people to spend their money on it, and that's producerial. Cassavetes also, though, famously um, bragged about when the producers, when the money people would ask where the location was for the day, he would give them the wrong address. At the beginning of the evening, um, I said I was good at apologizing, and here comes the next one, which is, uh, it's a school night, and uh, I think we only have time for one more question, so. Yes, I just wanted to ask or, if, oh. Yeah, okay, go. If uh, any of you allocated time and money to rehearse before you started shooting, and would you if you had the opportunity? Yes, not money, but time. And that's just having actors who are willing to do it, but most of them want to. Um, th I've always found that to be an essential part of, of preparation, especially when you're shooting in 13 days or 16 days. Yeah, I think it, I mean I think it's money well spent. I don't I don't like to really except for scenes that involve like a car accident or a sex scene or things that really where the actors are vulnerable or potentially at risk um, emotionally or literally. I don't like to overwork things, but I do like to have the time to hang out with them and talk with them and get them if they're supposed to have been married for 10 years, I want them to have some ability to spend time together. And if you don't set that time aside, it's probably not going to just appear out of nowhere. Um, since, uh, here comes a thanks, since everybody was so concise with their answers, we have time for another question. Yes, um, Kat a moment ago mentioned post-production. And I've worked in post-production sound for the last 10, 15 years. And over the last five years, I can almost recall the week when f filmmakers started to call and say, I've got half of what I used to have. I've got a third of what I have to, and now it's, I've got about a tenth of what I used to have. So I guess my question to you is, what do you expect when you get to post? And what are you, able, what are you, willing, what, what are you willing to give up, and what do you need? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, uh, um, I, would, I wouldn't want to give up anything. Yeah. I've, heur I've heard post-supervisors say exactly that. Um, I mean, the post-supervisor for the spectacular now, the film I made after this, he's been working you know, in, in LA in independent films for 25 years. And um, he said that the, the budgets shrink in post and producers don't really understand the value of it, but they expect the exact same thing, which is to his consternation, because he's the, someone that, the guy that has to deliver. I mean, I don't want to give up time like to edit or to have good sound. That, to me, is... Post is where you find your film, for large part, or where your film teaches you what it is. I think it's one of the most vital parts of the process. Yeah, I mean, so do you fight? Do you fight for budgets there, or do you, or do you just let that if, go? And, and you know, if you're a smart filmmaker who under there, there are people that are short-sighted, perhaps who haven't been through the process of making films, who will not understand that a certain amount of time to edit your film or a certain number of mixed days for the sound, um, which is a place that people will say, sure, we'll, we'll do it in four days. We'll literally do a reel a day. Or, you know, things that where they don't really, they don't understand until they're there, like that there's not the time to make the creative decisions that you would like to at a leisurely sort of fun pace and sort of have espresso breaks. Like, 
they don't get that. But I would say people that um, really value value everybody who works on the film and value people who work on post understand how vital it is. I certainly do, and that's a place where I always want to put time and money for the time. And this is where the producer credit does come in handy, um, is you know, knowing, going into it, that this is what I want. And it's really hard when you're making your first film to put your foot down and say, I need these things, because people will say, no, you're lucky to be making a film. But I know for me, going into anything I do from now on, you know, I don't want to do a reel a day and then never have a day to actually listen to the whole film, which has been my experience, you know. Uh, but but it, but it becomes tricky, you know, with the last film I did, I said, no, you know, I will not film it in under 24 days. And then when they present me with a 19-day budget <laughs> a week before shooting, what do you do? Do you walk off the set? Probably not. Um, so <laughs> definitely not. Um, so it's, it's, it's that hard conundrum, but I think, the, you know, the more, the more people know that you're going to deliver, the more you have that right and that foresight to kind of say, this is what I need. And yeah, it's, it's a shame that that often falls by the wayside. Th that was wonderful. Thank, well, a whole bunch of thanks. Thanks to Th Cynthia and Shar for pulling this evening together. Thanks to all of you for coming. And a particular thanks to Jill, to James, to Amy, to Ben, to Kat for coming and um, schooling us in the best possible way. Thank you. And thank you, Howard.